For Krima Media's Policy, I'm Sashni Mudli. Jonathan Anser joins me today to discuss his book, Spy, Uncovering Craig Williamson. For a number of years in the 1970s, Craig Williamson was a very effective spy for the apartheid government. What made you decide to write about his life? There were a number of reasons. Um, f firstly, I was at WITS in the early 1990s and I joined NUSAS and um, although at that time it was the end of apartheid, there was still a sense that there were spies on campus and I got quite intrigued about uh, you know, what it meant for somebody to infiltrate an organization and then lead this double life. I wanted to know what it took um, t for a person to actually do that. And then in 1995, I, I went and studied at Rhodes University and um, I got quite intrigued by Ruth First as a journalist. Um, she was a brave journalist who, who did a lot of things that, um, and, and went in, that, in those times where journalists didn't go. And I was quite intrigued by her life. And then it was that year that I discovered that uh, Craig Williamson had been responsible for her death. Um, and the death of, Mar of, of Maurice Schoon's wife, Jeanette Schoon, and, and their daughter, six-year-old Katrain Schoon. So it was all these different reasons. And then um, in 2010, I was uh, in the car. I, I just arrived in Durban for a, a, a workshop that I was uh, giving, and I was with a young journalist. And uh, we turned onto the Ruth First freeway, and I turned to the journalist and I said, it just suddenly struck me, what does Craig Williamson think when he turns onto this freeway? And I said, I said, I wondered what Craig Williamson thinks. And the person turned to me and said, well, who's Craig Williamson? And then I thought, you know, we need to remember our history. We need to record what has happened, otherwise we'll forget it. So, so and I had followed, um, you know, w w the Truth Commission and I'd, I'd followed him getting amnesty and uh, I felt that he had escaped accountability and I wanted it in, in some way to put on record what had happened and what he was responsible for. As part of your research, you interviewed some of Williamson's former schoolmates. What did his former classmates have to say about him? Well, they didn't have very good things to say about him. Um, I mean, these are memories that are more than 50 years old, um, but he, he, uh, he had an impact even then. And um, it was quite difficult to track down these people, I think for various reasons, but eventually I tracked down somebody who was in, in his boarding house. And he remembers Williamson as a bully, um, somebody who, who had no real impact at school other than being a bully. Um, and then I went, and, and uh, th these were very similar stories that I heard from, from people who were at school with him. Um, and then I went to the St. John's archive and I started going through the old Johannian, which is the magazines from St. John's, which is where Williamson was at school. And there was no trace of him in, in these archives until I got to 1966. Um, and I, I had these, uh, this impression of Williamson just going through school unnoticed. Um, until 1966, I found this record that talked about an election which coincided with the general election in the country. And Williamson had uh, represented a very far right wing splinter group called the Republican Party. And he had won this election. And it was, it, it was a right wing group in the heart of Helen Sussman's, you know, liberal progressive federal party constituency. And uh, that seemed to tell a lot, that seemed to be quite instructive of, of what Williamson was like. Why and how was Williamson recruited as a spy? The how is quite easy in, in that I think he had gone into the police after school. Most people, um, you, you had to do, sort of white men had to do compulsory military service, um, but you could go into the police as an alternative. And he went into the police. And uh, I think they saw him as an English speaking person who um, was going to go to Witz and that he would be quite easy, um, it would be easy for him to infiltrate uh, the student movement. Um, how they did it, they just approached him and, uh, and they offered, it, they put this to him and it took him about a minute to say yes. So yes, I think they identified that he was quite clever, quite shrewd, and that he sort of vaguely fitted what they might thought would be a, a, you know, a, a profile of a left-wing English-speaking person. Um, he wasn't, didn't quite fit that profile though. 
How did he manage to infiltrate the student movement that was engaged in the fight against apartheid? Um, I think at that time there was a sense of paranoia. So people were suspicious of spies and there were questions uh, that had been raised because he had been in the police and because he didn't quite fit the mold of a typical lefty. Um, he was quite, he was big and he was almost like a rugger bugger rather than a sort of Marxist spouting lefty. But he, he managed to, to infiltrate because I think at that time nobody knew who was the spy and who wasn't. It was a time of deep paranoia so there were allegations flying around about who was a spy and you could never really prove it. Um, so I think some people were cautious and kept him at arm's distance. But also he made himself very valuable in the student movement. He, he, he knew about finances, he knew about administration, he knew about org organization. And so he was quite an effective person in NUSAS, which was the student movement he infiltrated. He, NUSAS was virtually bankrupt at, the t at that time and he nursed it back to financial health and he was quite a solid organizing person and in the left there weren't too many of those people who were prepared to get their hands dirty doing that kind of the grunt work and I think also the people gave him the benefit of the doubt and um, you know because he was a, a plant uh, in the sense that um, he was there not to uh, kind of, um, you know, if there would have been a meeting and somebody said something, um, he wouldn't pass this information on to the, the police for that person to be arrested. He, he was there to give information if, if, for the long term. So there was no consequences of him being there that they could see. The students didn't realize that um, if they had a meeting and they said something that, that the police would be there the next day. So they couldn't pin anything on him. But he was busy giving information about their strategies and, and, and how to disrupt um, what they were doing. At one point, the security police were actually helping anti-apartheid activists to flee from repression in South Africa. Tell us about this and Williamson's role. Yes, so, so this was also very cunning on their part. What they would do is they had a pipeline that, would, that they would smuggle people out of South Africa to Botswana. Um, and they did it for a number of reasons. Uh, it, it does sound quite odd. Um, but they would do it because it, it would build the credibility of Williamson. He was sending people out and helping the, 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 the kind of the activists get out of the country. The other reason was th that he, they would be indebted to him when they did get out and when they rose up through the, the, the ranks. And then another reason was that they, would, they were going to get out of the country anyway um, and arresting them on the border would have just meant six months in prison. That was what, you know, for escaping the country. That's, that, that was the, um, the penalty. But now it, 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 it enabled the, the security branch to know who was getting out of the country and where they were going. So it, it was quite a cunning plan. And then eventually, um, Williamson used his own pipeline to get himself and uh, Eric Abram out, out of the country. Eric Abram was um, a, a New SAS activist. He was quite on the fringes of New SAS, but he was a student activist who had then started a news agency that was anti-apartheid. And uh, uh, Williamson needed to get out of the country and to make a little bit of a, a song and dance about it. So he through a very calculated and manipulative way managed to convince Eric Abram to leave with him. So they walked into Botswana um, and uh, Eric Abram had some profile and was able to ha hold a press conference to, to talk about how he had escaped the, the security branch. And this helped build Williamson's credibility as well. So it was quite a cunning plan from the security branch. Can you give a sense of how far Williamson managed to get in penetrating the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa and beyond the country's borders? So when he, when he left and when he got out of the country, um, he landed a job with a, an organization called the IUEF, which is the International University Exchange Fund. And this was an organization that helped fund anti-apartheid organizations. So he placed himself 
with the money. So he was dishing out money, which was very useful uh, as, as somebody who was dealing with information because he was trading money for information. Um, and it placed him at the center of a, a lot of what was going on in the country in the anti-apartheid movements. Um, it also, you know, people wanted money, they needed money to, to operate, and so um, they turned to him and he would be able to have an idea of who was doing what in, in the left wing. Um, so it was, it, was, it was quite, again, it was quite a, a, a strategically brilliant place for him to be. Um, and then he used that to try and get into the ANC at quite a high level. Um, it, it's not clear exactly how far he got into the ANC. Um, he did at some point start his own cell within the ANC, but it was a cell of enemy agents. It was a cell of uh, himself, somebody called Carl Edwards, who was working for Boss, and another uh, apartheid agent. And um, th they got uh, two Ronnie Casrells, and uh, Ronnie Casrells was not convinced of them, and he gave them a number of tests, which didn't really prove either way if he was a spy or, or not. Um, and I think what, what he did do, what, what, of, what there is no doubt, is that he managed to sow mistrust and confusion and to manipulate events. I'm, I'm not convinced he got into the heart of the ANC as he, he claims and as it was uh, claimed when he returned to South Africa. But he, he did, you know, the ANC was, was quite a fragmented organization and um, he was able to manipulate factions within the ANC also, you know, cause ructions between the ANC and the Black Consciousness Movement and also the Pan-Africanist Congress. So he, he played a very de divisive role. What was Williamson's suspected involvement in Steve Biko's murder? What he has said is that um, he, um, when, when Steve Biko had come to the Western Cape um, and there was talks about Biko being smuggled out of the country to go and meet with Oliver Tambo and for the ANC and the Black Consciousness Movement to try and find some common ground. He had told, he had found out about this meeting that was taking place and the suspicion is that he had alerted the authorities to um, the fact that, that, that Biko was um, in the Western Cape and was on his way back to the, the, the Eastern Cape when he was uh, um, found at a roadblock. So it's, it's not really clear whether um, that led to them capturing um, Steve Biko, but um, he certainly passed on information about the meetings between Oliver Tambo and, um, and Steve Biko, and the IUF was one of the organizations that was trying to, to uh, set up this meeting. So there are question marks about his involvement in, in, in Biko's death. There are many lesser known struggle figures, one of them being Jenny Curtis, also known as Jeanette Schoen, after she got married. Tell us about her, her role in the struggle, and her fate at the hands of Craig Williamson. So one of the, re the reasons that I wrote this book was to kind of bring her into the public domain more. I, I, th I think it is one, as you say, I think it is one of the untold stories. N not that it's untold, but I think she has been forgotten largely. A lot of people have been forgotten for their roles. Um, and while, you know, Williamson was responsible for the, for the death of uh, Ruth First, he, he was also responsible for the death of Jenny Curtis and her daughter, Katrain. Um, the, the, the Curtis family is, in fact, a very interesting family in, in the South African liberation struggle. Um, Jack Curtis uh, and, and uh, his wife Joyce Curtis were very involved in, in politics, in progressive politics in, in, in um, I'd imagine it was about the, the 50s and 60s. Um, and uh, Jeanette and her older brother Neville were very involved in, in um, New SAS. I think Neville was the president and uh, Jeanette was the, the, uh, the vice president. And so they were involved as student uh, leaders. And then um, Jeanette became quite involved in the trade union movement and was responsible for helping to set up the trade mo union movement in South Africa. And she was, uh, Neville was hounded by the police, he was banned. She was also detained um, and eventually banned. 
and Neville eventually escaped and he, he went off to Australia and he went to Tasmania eventually. Um, Jeanette uh, was then banned and, and it was at this time that she met Marius Skuern who had come out of prison for planting a bomb at a police station and the two of them got together and got involved and they got married but they were both banned people so their actual marriage was uh, you know it, it, at that time two banned people couldn't be together so their marriage the actual wedding ceremony was illegal and they then uh, also smuggled themselves out of the country where they went into Botswana and they continued to work for the ANC she w was also involved in uh, the South African Congress of Trade Unions SAC2 and when they were in Botswana they had two children uh, uh, Katrain and Fritz and um, after a couple of years of, of them they were still involved in, in propaganda work for the ANC and research um, they got information that their lives were in danger and the advice from the ANC was to go to Angola and they did go to Angola um, and they went to the university uh, um, and it was an, on, on, on one of these days that uh, a bomb, a parcel bomb was sent and um, uh, um, the, the Marius w had stayed behind or he had gone to the capital and uh, Jeanette opened the bomb and it killed her and her daughter. Fritz was there but miraculously wasn't killed. He was two and a half at the time but he witnessed his, his mother and his, his sister um, being blown to bits. And I think that, that, that for me was really, really hard. Um, was, you know, you can kind of ex justify in your own mind, Williamson can justify in his own mind about killing people who are uh, um, kind of waging war against him. But a six-year-old is not waging against war against anybody. And I think, that, that, you know, that, that for me was something that, that really you know, made me sit up and kind of take notice, the killing of Katrain Skuern, who today would have been playing a, a very positive role in South Africa, I'm sure of. What were Williamson's feelings towards what he called moderate non-revolutionary blacks? Yes. <laughs> So, you know, th th this was at the time, he, you know, after he was eventually unmasked as a spy in 1980, he, that was when he got involved in the dirtier aspects of, of the, the, the war with sending parcel bombs. Um, and in 1985, he wrote a piece for Leadership Magazine, which was a think tank about the country's reform process. And it was clear that w what was happening is, is that they were looking for people to negotiate with. And they had identified the ANC as revolutionary blacks. And uh, he wrote about moderate non-revolutionary blacks. And it was essentially they were trying to kind of form an alliance or, 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 or go into a political partnership as they had done with the, with the tricameral parliament. They were trying to do this um, and identify an alternative to the ANC. And this is what he referred to in this think tank piece as, you know, moderate non-revolutionary blacks. Can you explain when and how Williamson's cover was blown and his role as spy for the apartheid state was revealed? Okay, so it, 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 it was blown in January 1980. There are a number of theories about, about why he, he was eventually unmasked. But I think the, the, probably the, the most accurate one was that um, just before then, um, a boss agent that was ha happened to be on the SRC when Williamson uh, uh, was on the SRC um, um, defected to Britain. And what had happened was um, boss discovered that this agent was uh, living with a man and uh, in uh, apartheid South Africa, uh, I'm not sure which was worse, being gay or being a communist. So uh, they, they were about to detain him and they told him that he must report. Th this man's name is Arthur McGiven. And they told him that he must report to boss headquarters the following day. So that, so bef so that night he went to boss headquarters with a suitcase and he just took a whole lot of documents and he fled the country. Um, and then when, when news that he had defected uh, kind of reached Williamson, Williamson was quite nervous that, uh, um, that, that McGiven would expose him. 
So what they hatched a plan, him and his handler, uh, Kutsia, Johan Kutsia, who went on to becoming the, the police commissioner, um, to try and blackmail the head of the IUF, the director. Williamson had be at this point had become the deputy director of the IUF, so a very influential position. And so they tried, so, so Kutsia flew to Switzerland and they tried to blackmail um, Lars Gunnar Eriksson, who was the director. And uh, to his credit, he refused to be blackmailed. And eventually, uh, and that is how Williamson was exposed. What was Williamson's demeanor during the TRC? And did he take responsibility for his crimes? I don't think he did. I think that he came there not to tell the story, not to confess, but because it was a way out of his legal problems. And he said so much, um, he said as much before he went to the TRC. Um, so I think he was there to try to justify what he did. And his justification was, this was a war. I was on the one side of the war. It was, I was a patriot protecting the country from the communists. So I don't believe that he went to the TRC to divulge the whole truth. Um, and I think he was quite smug and arrogant. Um, and the, the photograph on the, on the front cover of the book is from, taken from the TRC. And I think that speaks quite, quite a, you know, a lot about his attitude. During your research for this book, you were able to meet Craig Williamson in person. What was your impression of him? Yes, I, he was the very last person that I interviewed. So I had done all this research. I'd spoken to a whole lot of people. I'd got to know him through archives and through the eyes of the people that he had betrayed. Um, so I had an impression of him and I knew his story well. So the meeting with him was I just wanted to get a sense of him and I wanted to sort of look him in the eye and just see whether he had remorse. Um, so I, my impression of him was of somebody who doesn't have remorse who sticks to the script, he, and he has, I mean, in his, you know, w whatever you say about him, he's been consistent about his story. You know, throughout the years, he believes that what he did was right. Um, and, it, you know, I wasn't going to change him. It, it, I wasn't there to argue with him, but, I, you know, nobody was going to, to, to change his mind. And I did ask him what it was like uh, what he felt when he turned onto the Ruth First Freeway. Um, yeah. What was his answer? He just went bright red and then he, 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 he uh, said that um, R Ruth First uh, and Marius Skuren and Jeanette Skuren, um, th they knew the risks involved. So he didn't really answer the question, but he said, you know, they knew the risks involved. They were part of the ANC and uh, he was just doing his job but he did go bright red. What sort of life does Craig Williamson lead today? Well he, he, he leads, he's you know he's kind of slipped into you know under the radar and um, he, he's you know I kind of stalked him a bit on social media and I tried to you know pry into his Facebook life and from what I can gather he lives a life free of consequences so he, he, he's um, you know he's a retired he's still involved in, 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 in um, a tobacco company where he, he, he brings tobacco in from Botswana into South Africa um, and uh, he's got a granddaughter that he's a, he's a doting grandfather and he's got three children um, and he lives a life without consequences um, in a very wealthy suburb of Johannesburg um, and enjoys the good life. What do you think of the super spy label, which some say applied to Williamson? Does it not serve to lend some credibility to conduct that was in fact reprehensible? Um, I, I, look, I mean, he was undercover for eight years. So he must have been a good spy in that he wasn't uncovered. I don't think he did uh, the things that he, you know, I don't think he was as, as effective. You know, when he came back, he was uh, um, kind of big up as the super spy who had 
infiltrated the KGB and uh, you know and and he boasted about how you know he, he, how close he got into the heart of the ANC and he wrote a piece for the police magazine which basically made it sound as if he controlled the ANC in fact he went to to Moscow but as a tourist so there was you know he got nowhere near that sort of level of being an undercover agent i think he was effective in that he dis, he sowed distrust amongst the ANC comrades and the new SAS comrades he 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 was effective um, whether he was a super spy, he was probably South Africa's most effective spy. I don't think he did you know, anything near as, as he claimed to have done, but he was effective. He left a trail of destruction in his wake. So yes, uh, yeah, uh, I'd, I'd, I'm not sure, you know, does it lend credibility to him? I don't think he's seen as credible. Um, he's, seen, he's, you know, he's seen as a killer, I think which is what he is. That was Jonathan Anser discussing his book Spy, Uncovering Craig Williamson.